We are receiving a great deal of interest on investor news right now surrounding the rare earth sector, but doesn't seem to be translating to the market. Constantine, what is going on with the rare earth market? Are you seeing the same trends happening from your perspective? Well, uh, hi, Tracy. Um, the, there's never a dull moment in, in the rare earth industry. And yeah, there's all kinds of trends that it seems that the trends that were apparent in um, the, uh, around the end of 2023 have continued into 2024. Um, I think we can, we're seeing a continuing slide in prices, primarily for neodymium and praseodymium, which hurts the industry and hurts all the players because that's where most rare earth producers make money. Um, I think that will, I'm, I'm a little pessimistic for the near term. I think that will continue uh, for all kinds of reasons that we could get into it. Uh, and also, um, I, I think there is a continuing interest in developing new deposits, new production, refining capacity, uh, especially outside of China, for good reasons and bad reasons. But, you know, that the interest continues. And, and in my view, this is when prices are down and valuations are down, this is where you spend capital to buy things and to do things on the cheap as much as possible. And you take advantage for um, the good times when they return because they will invariably return like they always do. It's a cyclical industry. And those trends are with us, have been with us for three decades and they'll be with us for at least another three. Jack, I'm certain you have something to add. Do you agree with what Constantine has said, or would you like to disagree? No, I I, I agree, ex except that I think that the low prices may be here for a while, uh, because uh, the principal producer in the world is, is China, and China's having a very bad time economically right now, and it has nothing to do with rare earths. It has to do with... Um, the way they organize their economy. And the rare earths are just reacting uh, to this uh, as Chinese internal demand goes down in, in a period where China had announced, and nobody here pays any attention, that they would double their capacity in rare earth permanent magnet production by the year 2025, in other words, in 11 months. Uh, they're well on their way to doing that. The magnet producers in China are are building enormous increases in capacity. But right now, uh, with the Chinese economy down and Chinese people not interested in, in buying expensive items like cars, they've been burned so badly by real estate. Uh, I just think that since China produces in or anyway, maybe 70, 80% of the world's rare earths, and certainly in magnets, over 90%. Uh, they continue to produce. They they need to sell things. So the prices here are, are not going to go up any anytime soon. I don't know when, but Kasi made a good point that I'd like to expand on just for a second. This is the ideal time for real mining and real processing companies to get into the game because right now you can buy you you can attempt to buy raw material sources on the cheap and I, don't, I don't mean by the raw materials i mean by the sources by the mines and this this is an unusual opportunity for just a very few clever businessmen to to get in at, at the bottom of course you need capital but some businessmen have the capital. And as far as processing goes, I've never thought it was such an arcane uh, topic. Uh, the reason people don't build processing in the West is there's nothing to process. So uh, to take a flyer on building processing takes even more nerve than taking a flyer on, on buying raw materials. Anyway, all this is happening and low price is driving it. I just, I, I, as you know, I'm not an investment advisor. But I would be very, very cautious of people who aren't producing anything. 
Constantine, would you like to add anything to that? Because again, we're seeing a great deal of interest in the public market sector, and of course, prices and things that make sense don't always don't all, always equate with what's happening on the market. Yeah, I I think there's always a disconnect between reality versus expectations. So I I think there are two, and I agree with Jack. China continues to be the driver. Where perhaps we disagree a bit as to what is really going on in China. The Chinese consumer has not stopped buying. China grew at 5% last year, or at least that was the, they hit the official target. I would have been shocked if they hadn't. Um, and where the problem is, <clears throat> is that the main consumer of rare earths today, the magnet industry that feeds the electric vehicle uh, production in China, because China produces more than half of the world's EVs, it's not growing as fast as people thought it was going to grow. It's growing, but not, not as fast. So that has created a problem between inventories and actual production and demand. So I think we are in a little bit of pain in the near term until the inventories get corrected. However, we also saw very recently an increase in um, uh, mining and production quota uh, awards in China. I think this is a signal that the Chinese government is sending to the world that the Chinese domestic industry will need more rare earths. Um, and that will be met, that increasing demand will be met with additional mining and additional uh, refining in China and abroad. However, in the near term, I think it does create a little bit of an excess, more further excess of supply over demand. And Jack and I are in agreement then that uh, in the near term, and perhaps in Jack's view, a little longer than the near term, prices are going to continue to be under pressure. Because Jack, you obviously want to add something to that? Yeah, you know, uh, for some reason, uh, the uh, journalists and analysts have forgotten that the law rules of supply and demand. And just as Constine said, as long as the supply is in excess, the prices are not going to go up, at least uh, not where I went to school. So uh, I, the problem really is going to originate in China again. I'll tell you what, the, the great... Um, prophet Elon Musk said just, I believe, last week that the biggest danger to the OEM uh, automotive industry in the West is China. And he means cars. He says, if, the chi if, the, if America should lose the 25% tariff or the Chinese make even better uh, cuts in their costs, and if, if Europe doesn't erect a tariff, then he he believes Chinese electric cars will simply dominate the uh, the market in the in the very near term, and he's he's really right. And and, and what Constantine was saying about the Chinese economy, I, I agree. Uh, the Chinese car makers seem to be still making a lot of cars. Where are they going to go? Well, uh, when I went to school in the nineteenth century, I guess. Uh, the uh, what happens in capitalism is if I have excess production, I export. Well, Keith Bradshaw had a brilliant article in the New York Times this week. I saw it talking about BYD, calling it the Tesla or China's Tesla killer. Um, you know, 10 years ago, you wouldn't want to go anywhere near a BYD. It was so poor, it was just, it reminded me of the old Yugo when I first saw it in China. <laughs> I would never put my kids in it. However, back in the days when I was working and I was doing my frequent China trips, I always made it a point of going into car dealerships in China. And in the last few years, I've been going into electric vehicle dealerships. I have been shocked about the, with a quality to price relationship of Chinese EVs because the Chinese supply chains have figured out how to keep Mercedes and BMW and Lexus and Honda and so on happy. So they're taking those parts 
you know, the finishing and the seats and the dashboards. It's extremely high end and it's at a fraction of the, co of the cost that you would see in North America. So BYD and Neo and Geely and uh, Lee Auto and all those countless brands of EVs in China, they're making really good cars at a very low cost. The other fascinating point in Keith Bradshaw's article is the fact that BYD, guess what? They just built their own ship to carry 5,000 EVs across the ocean. The Chinese industry is has built 12 of those and they're getting ready to just take over the world with their EVs. And I don't see Detroit or Stuttgart or Seoul, Korea or Toyota City responding. I mean, we're all, you know, in the West, we're just at the mercy of whatever initiative the Chinese industry is taking. And I think, guess what? This isn't looking particularly good for EVs in the West, unless the EVs start learning from the Chinese uh, playbook and start responding with cars that consumers want to drive at the price that consumers want to pay. Because so far, you know, Detroit and its love affair with the truck and the big SUV, when you translate that into luxury, big SUV EVs, well, you know, the numbers just don't work out. Anyways, I'll stop pontificating with that. Uh, I have one thing to add. Uh, I, I uh, also noted that article by Bratcher. And what struck me is something that I've seen several times before. BYD makes 70% of the components of its cars internally. Okay. So does Volkswagen. And both of them, Volkswagen just announced they're going to make the electric motors for their powertrains for EVs in-house. They're building a factory in Hungary just to do that. BYD already does that. General Motors is repurposing a factory to make electric motors, drive motors for cars. All of them need rare permanent magnets to, to build those motors. But the thing here is that in America, 25, 35 years ago, 30 years ago, everyone made their own components. General Motors had Delco. Uh, Chrysler had Mopar. Ford had, you know, Fomoco parts. Okay, they all controlled their components. The 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 cycle of capitalism in America did away with that. You know, we, to just in time supply from outside suppliers because they could squeeze outside suppliers. They couldn't cut costs anymore inside. Now, the car companies are all going back to that. But is there time? enough for General Motors, Ford, Stellantis, etc. I'm just talking American market, to do that in time. Yes, they can make motors. They need magnets to make motors. They don't know how to create a magnet industry, the, the car companies. And they're very resistant to learning. They, they remind me very much of the U.S. Department of Defense. So let's jump right in here, Ben. So at some point, the Chinese are going to do what they do regularly, which is make an announcement that they're missing a critical mineral. And then all the stocks in that particular sector look like a hockey stick for approximately three days and then return to normal. What is happening with the magnetic materials in general uh, on the planet? I mean, where should investors be, be looking? We drew a lot of attention recently to the Middle Eastern interest in Africa competing with China. Constantine, can you talk to that? For, uh, where should investors be looking? Well, that's a tough one. And I'll preempt my comments by using Jack's comment earlier. I'm not an investment advisor. I, I know what I like. I, I'm a patient investor personally. Um, so just um, as Jack is an advisor to um, a number of companies, I recently became an advisor to uh, a small Canadian uh, junior with a very interesting uh, deposit in Brazil that I visited. 
I think Brazil, based on what I saw and what I talked to people about, Brazil could be a game changer because it has some very, very large deposits of ionic clays that do two things. One, they have a preferential heavy rare earth mineralization, still with good light content, neodymium, praseodymium, uh, but more importantly, a very attractive content of heavy magnetic rare earths, dysprosium and terbium, which the world outside of China or the world outside of Southeast Asia, uh, Myanmar, Vietnam, Laos is in deficit. So I think this could turn to turn out to be a very interesting source of heavy as well as light rare earths, Brazil. Um, the ionic clays themselves um, are amenable to a much easier extraction of the rare earths as well. And that also means lower cost extraction of the rare earths, as long as you're careful how to do it and you don't make a mess like the Chinese South China clay miners did um, creating all kinds of damage to the environment to the point where the central government had to uh, to step in and shut everybody down. And those miners moved over to, to Myanmar and Laos and to a lesser degree, Vietnam as well. So I think if Brazil plays its cards right and the companies that are exploring in Brazil and developing projects in Brazil, one of which is has been commissioned at Serra Verde, um, uh, then I think Brazil could be a game changer. So I, if I were to put, and let's let's face it, I, I put in a little bit of my my own money into uh, the projects that I advise. I mean, I I hate to advise without any skin in the game. Uh, so I, I I I do like Brazil in particular. Brazil has its own challenges, red tape, etc. But they're getting it. They're they're learning the game. They they've created some of the biggest players in the world in tantalum or niobium at CBMM and um, iron ore. So they know how to create global champions. And I think um, the various levels of government in Brazil are applying some of those lessons to uh, the rare earth industry in, in their country. So I, I keep an eye on Brazil because it could be a game changer. And of course, that was the catalyst, one of the catalysts for doing this interview today was that I noted three world-renowned experts in the rare earth industry had all joined the advisory board for Appia Rare Earths and Uranium. Uh, Jack, can I ask you why you joined this uh, advisory board? Uh, yes, I, I have to uh, more than agree with Constantine. I've uh, been looking at heavy rare earths ionic clays for some time. And I believe, based on what I know about the non-Chinese uh, heavy rare earths, that Brazil is the new uh, font of, of material for the Western world. And quite frankly, the interesting thing about Appia, Appia's numbers are so high compared to Southeast Asia, it's incredible. Now, my learned friends in Southeast Asia are telling me, oh, no, no, that's not an ionic clay. It's, it's, it's covalently, it's minerals. It's microcrystalline minerals. I said, so what? I said, the, the grades are so high that if you have proportion ionic clays and minerals mixed, you can extract with simple materials ammonium sulfate, and you can use sulfuric acid to get the rest. The cost won't be important here because the dysprosium terbium levels are so high, as are the neodymium praseodymium levels. I think, and you know, I'm I'm not a, a guy who, who says this very often. I think Appia is absolutely a home run, and that doesn't mean there won't be others. But the one I'm focusing on is Appia because they asked me to look at this. And I was astounded by, by the what, what I think are the grades and the extent of the field. Uh, looks like looks like it's ionic clay. It's great. Uh, it's been tested, I believe, uh, for extraction, and it's a winner. So um, this is the United States and Europe 
have exactly no sources of heavy words. None. Okay? So, if we don't get them from a friendly place, we're screwed, and, and as are the Europeans. The problem with Brazil is political. It's not, it's not environmental. The, uh, one thing, these clays have very low thorium and uranium. I don't even see it measured. So that's not an issue. But Brazil is a, is a big country. It's a modern country, 200 million people. Uh, they have a lot of politicians. There's a, there's a stampede into Brazil. Mm -hmm. There's all kinds of absolutely solid projects. As I mentioned earlier, uh, Serra Verde uh, announced the commissioning of its plant. Um, and now they have entered production. Um, Meteoric from Australia has been developing uh, a, a very interesting project on the back of a lot of work that um, JOGMEG, the Japanese government entity, did in Brazil. And it did confirm that those clays are ionic. Apia. Recently, um, and the, a, a company owned by the home office, the family office rather, of an Australian billionaire bought a whole bunch of concessions in Brazil, some of which are ionic, some of which are not. But as I said, there is a bit of a stampede. And since Jack mentioned thorium and uranium, which continues to be the boogeyman, uh, in the rare earth industry, and if you're not careful, it will bite you badly. Um, as uh, a lot of our friends in the rare earth industry have found out, you know, you have to talk about energy fuels as well, because energy energy fuels has acquired uh, an asset in Brazil, a heavy mineral sands asset, which contains a lot of monazite, which is, for me, one of the best possible sources for uh, magnetic rare earths, as well as a, a lesser source for uh, heavy rare earths. And Energy Fuels is only one of the very few companies in the world that can deal with uranium and thorium. I mean, after all, that's their business. And in fact, when you look at all the companies in the industry, their stock has done better than others simply because of their exposure to uranium, uh, which is doing really well. So I'm pretty sure, uh, I'm, I'm pretty confident that Mark Chalmers and his team at Energy Fuels will will put together a very solid business plan as he's going around the world securing assets. So, you know, I'd keep, but ultimately, Brazil is emerging as a jurisdiction that combines excellent resources in various mineralizations that with, um, if the world outside of China or even China plays uh, its cards right. I think Brazil will be a major source of uh, lights, heavies, magnetics, non-magnetics. Uh, but it could, as I said, um, all of this effort in Brazil could be um, a game changer. No question, in my mind. So let me just ask you a question there. Um, with all of these increasing demand for these magnetic materials, how can the spot prices for the neodym neodymium and dysprosium be reducing, Constantine? Would you like to comment on that? Sure. I mean, um, and I, you know, we, we talked about what prices should be before, and 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 pricing is a function of supply and demand, and right now, um, and and. If, if you take inventories into account, we're in an excess of supply position because as I mentioned earlier, given China's slower growth, growth nonetheless, but slower than was anticipated, and given growth outside of China, which is also slower than anticipated, you, you find supply chains with a lot of inventory. This happens frequently, and it starts in China. We've just gotten into the Lunar New Year. What does every company in China need just before the Lunar New Year? It needs cash. And if it doesn't have cash and has inventories, it sells down its inventories to get cash so they can give bonuses, cash only bonuses, not transfers to bank accounts and things like that. So, you know, when, when you close a plant and a company for a couple of weeks for the Lunar New Year, you shake hands with every employee and you hand them an envelope with cash. And 
I know it sounds odd for this day and age, but all the smallish companies, they all sell down what they can to get cash, to get ready for the Lunar New Year. And this always happens. Um, you know, industry shuts down for a couple of weeks, and maybe by the time all the workers go to uh, their villages and come back, it's probably closer to three weeks. Uh, so during that time, there's zero demand because everything shuts down in China. And to make it, to make, you know, the pressures even more pronounced, the couple of weeks, three weeks before you go into uh, the Lunar New Year holiday, everybody sells down their inventories to, to, to get cash. So this is very, very seasonal in China, and it shouldn't surprise anybody. So you, you couple that with what appears to be um, a Chinese uh, strategy or the Ministry of Industry uh, strategy to loosen the controls on mining and the supply side of things, plus the continuing uh, expansion. I mean, every, everywhere, when you go to Brazil, for example, or when I go into the Middle East, or when you're in Australia, you see a lot of Chinese companies. It reminds me of the 60s and the 70s where American companies and European companies were all over the world looking for resources. Well, the Chinese companies are doing exactly the same thing now. I mean, uh, you go to Brazil, you will always run into two or three Chinese companies knocking around, looking for lithium, looking for rare earths, looking for cobalt, copper, whatever. So the Chinese economy has grown to the point where they have created their own global champions. And those guys are all over the place looking for the resources. So there's a competition uh, for resources. And I, I would have hoped that by now the West would have been would have learned something because this has been going on for a while. But we almost always seem to be caught by surprise simply because we're not paying enough attention. I don't know what it is, but getting caught by surprise again and again and again suggests that there's something fundamentally and structurally wrong with, with our collective approach. It's obvious what it is. There's no institutional memory here, none. We push out the old guys to get the cheaper young guys in, and the old guys take with them the knowledge and experience of managing companies. And the young guys just F it up, you know, and they say, well, the old guys left us a mess. We got to straighten this out. You know, you know, it's interesting to me, I have to say, that, that I've always understood that Americans don't bother to understand China. Now, Constantine, you're a traveler there. You've been there a great, you know, you had a business there, so you were there all the time. And so you understand something about the culture. Nobody here in government or in Brussels or in Ottawa seems to take that into account. It's China is a is not just a competitor, they're the enemy. Okay. And and my experience of the Chinese is that they're sort of confused. They say, why are we an enemy when we learned capitalism from you and we're competitive, we're competing? Okay. And and we go, oh no, you're evil, bad, you know. So they don't seem to understand that they're supposed to be subservient. And uh, the whole thing here, I'm just amazed by the lack of history knowledge here. All of our companies did the same thing. The first time I went to Africa was to a rental plant in, in the middle of, believe me, of nowhere. Okay. And in the French, you know, former French empire. But Renault was global in the 30s, as was Ford. Well, our companies pulled back. The Europeans pulled back, I think, for economic reasons. And the, the Japanese, Koreans, Chinese, they're just saying, hey, that's a good model. We'll follow it. So we have to wake up soon. Well, I mean, there are signs that we are learning we in the West, we are learning from past mistakes, but those signs are not very strong and mm -hmm. very frequent. Um, and I think the link between industry and government uh, has be has broken or has become adversarial 
in the West, where in China, it's much more collaborative. Um, you know, on my last trip there, I was reading articles about the government encouraging EV producers and EV supply chains to invest abroad so they can continue the dominance of the industry. So you see investment in Mexico, for example, by Chinese mm -hmm. companies. And I don't think they're ready to come into the States yet, or, well, a little less so into Canada. But they're, they will ride the EV uh, gravy train for a very long time. And they will be extremely difficult to uh, dislodge from that leadership position. And government is helping them along in terms of, you know, economic structures, incentives, making their life easier, access to cheaper power, access to lower carbon footprint power, all those things that sometimes in North America, we think, you know, it's socialism. Well, maybe it is, maybe it isn't, but right now, our system, is, especially when it comes to power generation, uh, alternative power generation and electric vehicles is playing catch up. And as I've said in our interviews before, the Chinese are excellent students of history mm -hmm. and they learn from their mistakes. And we need to do a lot of the same thing. We need to understand that history behind the development of, of certain industries. And I, I think definitely we need to learn from our mistakes because there's an old ancient Greek saying that committing the same mistake twice is not a sign of a wise person. And I think with, in the West, we have collectively committed the same mistake more than twice. So what does that say about us? But regardless, again, I'll, I'll stop my pontificating here. Japan. It was about a decade ago, Constantine, that you told me that I should be paying more attention to the Japanese market when it came to the magnetic materials market. Would you like to comment on their role in all of this right now? Well, the, the biggest company in the magnet industry outside of China is Shinetsu. Um, and uh, they have, I think, responded brilliantly to the Chinese challenges. So what did they do? They built a very large magnet facility in Vietnam um, on the back of a uh, magnet recycling, metal making, alloy making. So they're fully integrated in Vietnam. And that allows them to compete with on cost and quality. Because in, in my view, just to, so uh, I put my biases on the table, the best magnets in the world are made by Shinetsu and perhaps Hitachi. Uh, but Shinetsu is clearly in the lead. Um, and they have a cost structure with their base in Vietnam that is now cost competitive with the lowest cost producers in China. So, uh, yeah, um, I would keep paying attention to what the Japanese supply chain participants are doing in this field because Shinetsu is not going to give up. Uh, in fact, I think they're ideally positioned to take advantage of whatever growth comes um, in the West um, and they, they will continue to, to have a big piece of that pie. Um, the rest of the uh, Japanese companies, unfortunately, um, I don't think they have adjusted as effectively as uh, Shinetsu, so they're going by the wayside. Uh, Hitachi, on the other hand, they continue to innovate, they continue to do things, and we'll see how that plays out. Um, JVC, um, uh, TDK, uh, sorry, not JVC, TDK, I meant, uh, I always get confused with initials and acronyms. Um, TDK is a player um, and they, they need to, to respond uh, or they'll continue to stay a small player. And also you, you should continue to pay attention on innovation that comes out of uh, Japan, like Hitachi, I keep calling it Hitachi, it's Proteria. Um, they, they've developed a new electro, uh, electronic steel for uh, electric motors um, that is amorphous and it, 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 it imparts uh, an additional 5% efficiency to the design of a motor. Um, so the, Chinese, the Japanese will continue to, to push the R&D envelope 
uh, and some of the bigger and better companies will continue to get more and more competitive uh, in the industry. Jack, would you like to add anything further? Yeah, the biggest car company in the world on any given day is Toyota. They 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 um, compete with Volkswagen for the title largest producer of cars on the planet. And the chairman of Toyota uh, said a couple of weeks ago that his company is going, going to focus on a future market that's one-third EVs, one-third hybrids, and one-third uh, gasoline and kerosene uh, diesel uh, cars. And I thought that was absolutely brilliant because he was just saying out loud what everybody in Detroit whispers. They know that hybrids are the way to go, the ideal maximization of efficiency of both fuels, electricity and, and hydrocarbons. And the Toyota people just said, you know, the hell with it. We're, we're just going to tell you we're, why there, people are asking, why is Toyota slow at electric cars? Said, no, no, we're developing our three-part uh, model of our, of our uh, offering. Okay, so to show you just how uh, trend-setting that was, within a week, General Motors, whose chair, whose president had said, no more uh, anything but electric vehicles by 2030, suddenly announced, next year we're going to have a Chevrolet hybrid added to the line, and we will continue to make hybrids, etc. Okay, what I'm saying is, this is a trend, and people don't need to worry about, what about rare earths? Rare earth permanent magnet motors will still be used in hybrids because you have it's not a you don't need a little tiny motor you need a large motor to move the car because even if you only have 50 or 60 miles electric the electric motor has to move the water two tons of car so we're still going to be needing rare earth permanent magnet motors the most efficient lightest weight motors but in the in the end Who's going to make, do you know how long hybrids have been made by Ford and General Motors? Long, you know, for at least the last 20 years. But guess who introduced the hybrid into, into the world car culture? That's right, Toyota. If you remember the Prius, 1997 it was introduced. That's 20, let's see, 27 years ago. They've sold millions of them. They're still selling them. I'm, I'm okay, smiling now, back because in 1996, as they were rolling off the production lines, I was in Japan photographing for our annual report because back then we had books with a lot of photographs in them as our annual reports. Uh, one of our partners in Japan, uh, Nippon Yttrium, we were supplying Yttrium four, five nines to them, and they were turning <clears throat> into six, six and a half nines yttrium oxide, and they were supplying the Panasonic Toyota battery joint venture, the nickel metal hydride battery, and that battery is what was going into the Prius. So right, right. we did a photo shoot for the first generation Prius that was owned by the CEO of Nippon Yttrium, a, a lovely Japanese man, Mr. Kado, Kano. Um, and that continued, um, mm -hmm. and, and Toyota today probably has the best hybrid system uh, mm -hmm. out there to, to show my partiality again. But there is a reason, you know, back in, in, in my recent uh, past when I was still working, uh, one of my last decisions as CEO um, at Neil was to uh, build a new rare earth catalytic materials plant um, the largest of its kind in uh, in China, because in our own internal evaluation, the catalytic converters in internal combustion engines and hybrids uh, we are, still have another 10 to 15 years run rate. Um, and there's a lot of demand that will come from those cars. And, and let's be cynical about it. The fundamental reason, to quote uh, the former CEO of uh, Umicor, that you know three four years ago over dinner we're talking about, well, is everything going electric? And 
Our conclusion was no, because there is no way that the infrastructure, and Tracy, I've made this point before in our conversations, the infrastructure in the world, the mining infrastructure, the resource extraction, the refining, the supply chains, that this is the industrial part of the EV infrastructure is not going to develop fast enough and it will take trillions of dollars of investment. On top of that, you have to take the power generation infrastructure, the power transmission infrastructure, and the charging infrastructure, which doesn't really exist. I mean, let's face it, if we all drove electric cars, we wouldn't be able to charge them because we you know, the, the power isn't generated and the power isn't transmitted and we don't have any chargers to plug into unless we want to do like Chicago a month ago and wait for a couple of hours um, to, for our turn on the, uh, the high-speed chargers. So it will take longer and it will cost more money for the infrastructure, both the power infrastructure and the resource and manufacturing infrastructure to catch up with all the projections that the governments are imposing on the industry that by such and such a year, you will not buy an internal combustion engine and so on. And we both, again, quoting my, my, my friend, Mark Greenberg, uh, the former CEO of Umicor, we both felt that the natural bridge technology to an eventual electric future is hybrid. And that will take 15 years, 10 years, 20 years, something of that order of magnitude. And naturally, you know, the Japanese uh, have been at the forefront and the Germans have caught up and they, there's, there's some very attractive hybrids coming out of Germany as well. And now North America is responding. So because government is not moving fast enough and the industry is not moving fast enough in order to meet all the requirements for an eventual uh, electric vehicle future. Can I add one thing, Tracy? Uh, Absolutely. I, I was told uh, that, and I remember this, International Harvester, which few of you remember, used to make cars. They were called Scouts. They were the original uh, competitor to the Jeep. Okay. And in the 1980s, the engineers at Harvester came up with the idea of a hybrid. They made a hybrid scout, but nobody was buying a scout. It was, you know, I, I I had friends who had scouts and they were they were in love with them. They wouldn't give them up, but they stopped making them. Well, Toyota bought a license for the technology. That's I was told how it started. Okay. And by the way, your 1996 photos, remember in 96 they were making 97s. The model year was 97. So I was right. It was 97 when they introduced them. But in any case, notwithstanding that. This technology came out of the West, and as usual, we didn't pay attention to it. I'd like to thank both of you for joining us today to give us an update on what you're seeing happening, happening with the rare earth market, specifically in the magnetic materials. Thank you, Jack. And of course, as always, thank you, Constantine. Thank you, Tracy. Good to see you, Jack. Peace.